Good afternoon. I am Nora Hartman of Field Nation, and I want to welcome everyone to today's Business Hot Topic webinar. Today we'll be discussing why it's time to get your head in the cloud. Thank you for joining us. You will want to stay with us for the entire webinar because Borderless Learning, the premier partner providing cloud technology training, has a drawing for an Amazon gift card. The lucky winner will be notified by email. This is the ninth session of our Hot Topics webinar series with our partner, Borderless Learning, who provides learning programs so you can learn anywhere. We work hard to investigate and gain platform partners who will bring additional value and insight into our community. We thank Borderless Learning for providing today's free training session and will continue to bring more learning opportunities to your way in the near future. With me today are our guest speakers, Richard Schatzberg, CEO of the NCTA, and Tori Mignano, Partner Manager at Logical Operations. Richard has a history of running successful companies involved in technology. He has also been heavily involved in the New Jersey Institute of Technology's Continuing Education Program. The combination of these experiences is what led Richard to create the NCTA. Tori has been working with Richard and his team at the NCTA since their two organizations entered a partnership in December of 2015. Logical Operations and the NCTA have partnered together to accelerate the education and adoption of the NCTA's Cloud Master Program. With that said, let's move forward and keep this webinar interactive. When you have a question, please submit your questions in the question section of your screen. We will keep them for our Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Now, without further ado, I'll hand off the floor to Richard and Tori. Thank you very much, Nora, for introducing us. One moment while I get the PowerPoint up for everybody to take a look at. All right. So once again, thank you, Nora, for getting us started. Uh, just a quick agenda put together for everybody today. First, we'll share a bit about the current state of cloud. Then we'll get a sense of what the future state of cloud looks like, or the forecast, if you will. Finally, we'll take a look at the impact all of this has already had and explain how that impact can be managed with training, specifically Cloud Master training. As Nora mentioned, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A and we'll address those at the end. When we look at the current state of cloud, we know that adoption has been very rapid and is happening in huge numbers. As it currently stands, 90% of enterprises plan to maintain or boost spending on cloud computing in 2016. 89% of those organizations are using public cloud services specifically, and that public cloud market was estimated to be $70 billion in 2015 and is anticipated to more than double in just four short years. As you can imagine, and as you might already be feeling, the talent pool is incredibly small as a result of this extremely rapid adoption. Richard, given your experience with the NCTA and your background in various uh, software services companies, what is it that's driving this rapid, huge adoption? Well, I, th I think there are a variety of things that are driving it. I, I mean, in general, I think mainstream or you know third-party applications that were traditionally delivered on premise are, are now migrating to the cloud and you're seeing that in many many verticals you're seeing that in what used to be known as ERP systems and CRM systems in the medical industry you're seeing that with the electronic medical record systems in insurance uh, the major agency management solutions are now offered via the cloud but in general when companies have aging infrastructure they get to the point where they have to decide do they want to lay out money to replace that infrastructure or do they want to kind of rent infrastructure if you will on an as-needed basis 
Additionally, there are major movements, including mobile applications, including the Internet of Things, which is probably in the next several years going to be the, the primary growth factor that are continuing to, uh, to, to push the cloud forward, and, and most importantly, creating this massive vacuum um, in employment for, for people that, are, that have cloud skills. And what's interesting about it is it's not just software or infrastructure people. As much as anything, it's people who can sell solutions in the cloud as well as the technologists. So it's really a, a, an incredible growth opportunity uh, and hopefully we, uh, we can um, fit in there and uh, train people who can fill these slots. I think you really hit the nail on the head when you referenced Internet of Things, Richard. I mean, we've seen, um, you know, really just within the last couple of years that start to, to really grow as a, a buzzword, if you will, and when we think about where we have yet to go with Internet of Things. It's really not a surprise when we look at where cloud spending is anticipated to go. So um, talked on the, the last slide that it's expected by 2019 that um, cloud revenue will be $141 billion and by 2020 it's expected to be over $167 billion. So these numbers are just crazy crazy huge. Beyond that, 30% of organizations expect more than half of their IT services to be cloud-based. What I find interesting about that is already many organizations who have adopted various um, public cloud services and even implemented their own private cloud services are using many services. Um, one, one study I found identified that organizations on average are using three public cloud services and three private cloud services at any given time. And we're really in the pretty early stages of cloud adoption. When we think about how much it's going to grow, you can only imagine that more and more organizations will not only move their, uh, their infrastructure into the cloud, but they'll be using many different services in order to best facilitate their businesses. I think that really speaks to the point that we see here toward the bottom, that worldwide spending on infrastructure and as, as a service and platforms as a service are expected to grow at a faster rate than where as a service. So as more and more organizations sort of get their appetite for cloud wet with various SaaS solutions, they'll start investing more in moving various portions of their business um, utilizing some of the various platforms and infrastructure that is available. To that point, as we know already, the skills gap is already very wide and will likely continue to grow. And as we have more and more invested in clouds across organizations, the various skills are going to start changing as well. Um, so now we need people that know at minimum how to best manage and um, administer cloud services and implementations but as we go forward into the future uh, we'll need more professionals who know how to best operate clouds and manage those clouds with various applications and really make sure that they're plugging all of the needs of their businesses into the cloud so that they can get the most out of what they've invested in. Evidence of the skills gap is abound. LinkedIn recently did a study that found that the number one most requested skill in US job postings is cloud computing. Beyond that, the most in-demand skills were data mining, mobile development, network security, and middleware and integration software. So Richard, as you spoke to before with things like Internet of Things and all of the various drivers to cloud, it's really not a surprise that these are the other in-demand skills behind cloud adoption since they all touch upon one another. In yeah. addition to this, oh, go ahead, Richard. Go ahead, Tori, please. Sure. So um, in addition to this, it's also been found that the number one cloud adoption challenge for businesses is a lack of expertise and resources within their own teams. 
Uh, for the past few years, RightScale has run a state of IT report, and the number one challenge had been security up until 2016 when it was identified that actually the fact that there are too few people who have the cloud skills that businesses need has created an even greater challenge than security, which I really think speaks volumes to how massive the skills gap really is. Richard, you actually have a, a, a pretty interesting situation and I think a pretty personal uh, anecdotal piece of evidence that you can share on the, um, the impact of this mass adoption. Could you tell everybody a little bit about how um, the National Cloud Technologists Association and the Cloud Master Program came to be? Sure, I'm happy to. So it, it's interesting. I, um, it, as you said, it was really for very selfish reasons. Um, but it didn't start out with the idea of actually creating the NCTA. Uh, I am one of the early founders in a software services company with a couple of thousand employees um, globally. Uh, I had somewhat stepped out of the operation of that business for about six years while I had founded a technology business for people with disabilities. And when I came back to that business, um, what I found was that the skills of our engineering staff had really not um, kept up. That in effect we had kind of missed a generation and and really I really had to find a way to kind of um, cross a skill chasm. So you know cloud computing, seeing what was coming down the road, the Internet of Things, um, you know really were very attractive, the creation of new SaaS solutions, mobile, etc. Uh, so I went out there looking specifically to tool my own engineers with. I went out there looking for an agnostic cloud training program that was very much hands-on and that would uh, provide my employees personally with uh, a suite of skills, a true suite of skills, so that they could actually have demonstrable skills after this training, that it wasn't just, hey, a little bit about what the cloud is, but that they came out of this with technologies and tools that they could literally use and demonstrate that capability. And I really struggled to find anything. Um, and as, as was mentioned earlier, I have a vast uh, uh, background with New Jersey Institute of Technology many years ago, including running a, a portion of that university that included the non-credit or professional development area. And back then I had started in the web area a, a very similar program called Webmaster that to this day was the most successful program the university had ever run. It was an award-winning uh, program. So when I kind of um, saw this gap, I very quickly said, you know, maybe we can fill that gap by creating a, an agnostic hands-on cloud training technology program and very quickly went in and trademarked the names Cloud Master and Cloud Guru. Um, got together some experts in the field that I had been working with uh, for many years and that led to the formation of the NCTA and, and for the people that have gone through the program uh, over the last several years it really has changed their um, career path. Uh, one of the things about cloud is if you're already working in an affiliated field you, can, you don't have to worry so much about vendor agnostic training. You can go pursue you know, a vendor-specific training, grab that credential because you already have the prerequisite skills if you've been working in the field. Most of those people are getting absorbed because of the massive growth of cloud companies, especially infrastructure companies. And also, many of the managed services companies are grabbing people up as quickly as they can. So the experienced people are going to work directly for the industry players leaving this void on the business side, people who need, you know, cloud, tr cloud trained folks and need folks who can sell solutions in the cloud. Um, so really the vendor agnostic approach is the first layer for people that want to get into this industry. Uh, and then if they decide to move on and pursue vendor specific training, it's really the, the agnostic training that gives them the opportunity to pursue jobs which then can put them in the direction based upon the needs of their employer for more vendor specific training if required. And that is exactly what happened uh, with my employees. And it's working for my employees, it's worked for the, the, uh, the people that have pursued the Cloud Master training with NCTA and, and it's really been quite effective. 
so when we look at the courses that you put together with those industry experts, Richard, um, it, it really turned out to be three courses and an ultimate Cloud Master designation, if you will, like you referenced yourself. Very um, much. So, so there's uh, the Cloud Technologies course, Cloud Operations, and Cloud Architecture, each of which have their own exams, and once each exam has been passed, an individual would qualify as a Cloud Master. Can you share a little bit about what learners can expect within each of these courses? Sure. Um, the cloud technologies, really what we try to do is give them a, a, a portfolio of a lot of the technologies that are in the field. We don't so much pay attention to specific technologies, although they do learn technologies, learn how to implement technologies, but as much we want them to be able to have enough knowledge to compare and contrast to determine the best solutions for the business case. Um, on the operation side, you know, you, you can really see what's here, um, but what's added to that, I would say, is understanding what some of the complexities on the operation side, things like pricing, things like vendor lock-in, if you will. So it's, it's not just server builds instances, and certainly the people that go through the program actually do launch their own instances. So they have experience going in and signing up as a, as a a fresher, if you will, you know, somebody that's never done this before and literally creating an account and building cloud instances. So it's it's a, certainly a skill that they take with them. And and cloud architecture, I guess, just as the name uh, provides, is really about what's the proper architecture for the business case. And in many cases, uh, the people that have gone through our program actually, as part of their project, will use their own companies as a business case to actually make a presentation on why the architecture that they've designed fits the need of their business. And that's really what that module is about. And then the people that pursue all three uh, and complete them uh, are, are afforded the Cloud Master designation. So for an individual who, who does achieve that Cloud Master status, Richard, what's the, the value that they're able to bring to an organization they might already work for? Or um, if they're out on the job market looking for a <laughs> new career in cloud, why should that name really resonate with an employer looking at their resume? What's interesting about the name, you know, I, I think people are so now familiar with the concept of webmaster. <laughs> Um, and and what's, what's funny about it is, you know, we launched the Webmaster program at NGIT and unfortunately did not trademark that name, which was too bad because we, we had an opportunity to get it many, many years ago. You can only imagine how old I am based upon that, what I just told you. But, uh, you know, because people are used to that designation, I think the, the phrase Cloudmaster fits in with you know, I have an understanding of a lot of different areas of the cloud. Um, how they use it within their profession or within their existing company or pursuit of another career is really individual specific. We've seen examples where, you know, um, .NET programmers have wanted to move to more modern technologies to be able to start building SaaS solutions for their companies or for, them, for themselves. They want to move on to mobile applications, things of that nature. Um, on the IT side, you know, historical, you know, guys that were infrastructure service folks, help desk people wanted to, you know, be able to learn about cloud architecture, maybe to pursue careers in some of the fast growing cloud companies, whether it be Amazon or, or many of the others, AWS. Um, so it's hard to say specifically. It's been a little bit over all over the board, very uh, much uh, geared towards the individual's interests and the interests of their employers or their own career path. Uh, but what's been wonderful about it, that in almost all of the cases, the Cloud Master designation has given them the opportunity to go pursue uh, whatever their personal interests are. And that's really what we're about. We, we want people to have a career path of their choosing. Uh, and, and that designation of the Cloud Master really has carried some presence, uh, although it's not the webmaster designation, I think people are familiar with that designation. It does carry some weight for them. 
and, and it's really been an effective credential and an effective brand name for, for us and the people that have gone through the training program. And Richard, with the, the designation, what type of, um, I guess, transferable skills would an individual expect to take from this? I mean, is it, can, do, should people expect that this is pretty intensive and hands-on, or is this a much more um, theoretical approach to understanding um, the, the various topics that we see here? It is definitely not theoretical. This is an extremely <laughs> hands-on program. So they will be walking out of the program with a demonstrable portfolio of skills. And what's nice about it is the skills kind of build on themselves. So in effect, when they leave the program, if they so choose to keep their instances live, they can actually use that with employers to demonstrate these capabilities. So everything we do is, is always from a hands-on perspective. Um, you know, and and you know, within each of the three modules, they're gaining skills and leveraging their skills for their own purposes, whether it's building websites, whether it's building cloud instances, mobile applications, whatever they so choose to do as their hands-on experience. As long as they keep those instances live, they have it out there in the world as a demonstrated capability. Great, and and since they're actually using true live environments, what are some of the different vendors and solutions that a student would get that experience with through the course of the program? Well, I, I mean, I, I, it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, a, a complicated thing to answer as each of the modules has many skills that they'll learn, but, you know, one of the things we do is we walk them through, you know, Amazon Web Services. We walk them through through Google Services so that they can understand, you know, what the differences of these infrastructure as a service solutions are. Why certain are more generic, and why you others, you know, uh, for example, a, a company, one of our lead instructors, um, came from a company called VirtuStream that was since bought by EMC and is now a part of Dell. But the the VirtuStream infrastructure was specifically designed to handle large-scale um, ERP, uh, specifically SAP solutions. So there was just specific um, architectural components that allowed that infrastructure to be very effective for large-scale uh, ERP solutions versus an Amazon Web Services that certainly can be architected for those specific type of applications, but I would say is much more generic in nature. So they're using each of those skills. Uh, they're actually going in and building uh, infrastructure as a service instances and then leveraging uh, solutions to be able to put forth uh, um, applications within those instances. Uh, but it's, a, it's really a cross-section of different types of solutions and applications that they're using based upon those modules. And then for their own purposes, they can select the ones that are most interesting to them and most useful for them. But what's beneficial is they come out of the program having some point of comparison so that they could say, yes, I, you know, I built in this technology, uh, for example, Amazon Web Services, but I'm familiar with this and this and this. And that is also something that I think has proven very effective for our folks because they do have a good cross-section of skills. Right, and I, I would have to imagine that proves quite valuable um, to employers or um, job seekers even when there are companies out there, like I said before, using various different solutions and, and kind of dabbling in all sorts of different vendors. So going out there and taking Cloud Master training and, and getting that exposure to all these different things versus honing in on a, a very specific vendor, um, I think really just drives that value even further. Very much so. Well, I've, I've probably peppered you with enough questions, Richard. Um, I think at this point, um, it's probably fair to say that uh, we should take some questions from the audience. So um, 
Nora, I, I suppose I'll turn things back over to you. Hopefully we've had a few more questions come in through the Q&A that Richard and I can help tackle. I just wanted to add to it, uh, for anyone that wants to get a little bit more feedback on the components that are in each of the modules, um, they can just visit our website. Uh, it's thencta.com and right on the website are, is a little bit more detail about some of the technologies that fit into each of the modules. So in, instead of going into the, all of them, uh, you know, people can feel free to, to go to that website and, and read about some of the technologies and they're, they're included in, in the course module descriptions. That's a great point, Richard. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Richard and Tori, for um, the fantastic presentation. We do have a few questions here. Uh, so the first one is, how does or how did LinkedIn define cloud computing? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, can't, I can't say off the top of my head. Um, the the article or the the study that I read from LinkedIn really didn't provide a, a strong computing um, really because when they were doing their analysis they were looking at job postings and anything that um, used the phrase cloud computing would have come up um, in their results. I'm guessing that their definition was quite broad. I, I also cannot speak to how they defined it, um, but I, you know, typically those type of operations will take a very broad um, definition that, that would include everything from network security, cyber security, IT managed services, things of that nature. All right. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions regarding um, the, the cost of these modules. Um, would you mind sharing where um, our viewers might be able to find this information? Sure. So for that, I would definitely recommend contacting Borderless Learning, who will be delivering the classes. Um, and they'll be able to share with you a little bit more about um, what their pricing looks like. Uh, to give you a rough idea, um, you know, being that these are tech courses, uh, you might expect them to be a little bit more in line with something like a CompTIA course, if you're familiar with them. Um, and the, the courses themselves are designed so that um, the first Cloud Technologies is three days of training. So it's likely that that one uh, will be the lowest price and then the other two courses, Cloud Operations and Cloud Architecture, are each five days of training. So those will probably be priced a little bit higher. Great. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is, um, what is the typical time that it would take to get through the program? Sure. So, like I just mentioned, uh, the Cloud Technologies course is three days of training. Um, if you run it in a quote unquote boot camp style where you're doing um, a full day each day. And then the other two courses, Operations and Architecture, are each five days of training. So, in total, it would be 13 days of training. Um, I know, Richard, you have referenced in the past that. Uh, previous candidates do better if they take the exams as they go along. So um, it, it probably would behoove an individual, and, and feel free to chime in here with any evidence from uh, previous training sessions, Richard, but uh, would behoove participants of the program to, you know, maybe take cloud technologies, take a couple of days to let all of it absorb, and then, you know, take their exam. And then after they take their exam, then move into the next module and do the same into the next module. So um, probably looking at a month to six weeks time just to make sure that you can get that exam in there and then, of course, have time for the actual days of training. Yeah, not much more to add there. I completely concur. That, that's the approach that most people have taken and I think has proven most successful. Great, thank you so much. Um, this next question is directed to Richard, and it is, what is the reason why an organization may not migrate to the cloud? 
You know, I, I boy, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I think there is, you know, one education. Uh, I think in many cases there is still still some insecurity about the cloud. I think that's going away because you have the largest organizations in the world, governments, banks, uh, uh, leveraging the cloud in, in big ways. Um, but you know, for you know the SMB market especially, um, it's just lack of education and, and some concern of not having a server rack in their office, kind of the feeling of loss of control. But the truth is, as time goes along, uh, you know, I think the cloud, the, the word cloud goes away and the concept of cloud computing just becomes computing. Uh, the truth of the matter is, as the number of devices, Internet of Thing devices, continues to grow at an exponential rate, you know, people are going to be using the cloud without even knowing they're using the cloud. Uh, they're going to be wearing devices. They're going to be devices monitoring traffic on the highways. Things that already things that are already out there. You know, home-based healthcare devices, and all of these devices use the cloud not only for data storage but for the pipe, for 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 connectivity. Um, you know, I I, I used to uh, even going back a couple of years ago, I used to when I would public speak, I would have I would ask people. How many of you have used a SaaS solution? And you know, a couple of hands would go up. Now certainly more would go up, but back then a couple of hands would go up, and I would say, everyone whose hand didn't go up, please raise your hand. And I would bet them, no matter how much money they had in their pocket, that they're already using a cloud solution. And then I would say, has anybody ever heard of Facebook or LinkedIn? Uh, and they didn't even realize that these were cloud or SaaS solutions. So that once they kind of become more familiar with it, uh, they, I think they, you know, over time start to realize this is the way things are going. You know, great CRM solutions, Salesforce and others are leading the way, great uh, ERP applications, and as we said, other, you know, vert mar ver vertical market segment applications are all going to the cloud. So people are just signing up for the subscription just because it's easier and, and a little bit more cost effective in the short term. So, you know, I think some of the insecurity is going away, but there is still some people lagging behind. And th that, I would say, is the primary reason. Great. Thank you so much. That was a phenomenal answer. Um, our next question is, if the cloud is utilized instead of a data center, what would the cost be for cloud storage versus data center storage? Um, it, it, impossible to answer. It, it really depends on the use case. Um, you know, there the, a data center. You know, it can be you know declared a, a private cloud depending on the architecture. We have companies that are leveraging a hybrid model where they're using a private cloud for their very personal data, and then the public cloud for storage of other things that you know are less critical. So, for example, in the healthcare industry, if you have um, companies that are very protective of what's called electronic personal health information, and this is under things like HIPAA and meaningful use, they will store their EPHI, their electronic personal health information, in very secure private clouds or corporate clouds, but then use more generic, less expensive, um, you know, generic infrastructure service clouds. Um, public clouds to store things that are less sensitive. Other industries are trying to protect social security numbers, customer security numbers, credit card numbers, things of that nature. So anything that's um, PHI, personal, you know, or um, NPI, non-public personal information, uh, that is a little bit more protective and people are going out of their way to set up, for example, private clouds. But um, if they're just trying to store images or things that are less critical, less protective, they'll leverage a public cloud for that. As a follow-up to that question, um, there was a question asking that uh, if you can't compare the cost of both, which is more cost effective? Yeah. Um, so. The, the costs are different, uh, and in many cases, the accounting principles may be different, whether it's a capital expense versus an operating expense. So sometimes uh, the, the decision to go one way or another is really not geared towards the cost, but geared towards how the company wants to uh, account for it. 
Um, historically, setting up a private cloud has a larger upfront cost and a lower ongoing cost, where a public cloud has a lower initial cost. So it really is dependent uh, upon the situation. It, it's hard to say. Over time, I think a private cloud or a data center will be lower in cost than a public cl cloud, because in a public cloud, you're going to pay a monthly recurring service fee where depending upon how the data center or the private cloud is set up, you may pay a larger upfront ex expense, but a smaller maintenance or recurring fee that over time those two costs, cost curves will cross. Uh, but historically, a public cloud is a smaller upfront investment, but a larger ongoing maintenance or subscription fee. Awesome. Thank you so much for that uh, thorough answer. Um, we do have a couple more questions regarding um, the course, and I know that some of these may have been answered earlier, but since we're receiving questions, maybe you could just reiterate. Um, if only one of the three classes seems useful, can someone only take one class? Absolutely. And, and just to add to it, th that's specifically why the Cloud Master program was set up as three independent modules recognizing that not all skills are required for all people. Now, I will tell you that in most cases, the huge, huge, huge majority of people have pursued the entire Cloud Master program, but we have folks that have, you know, that already had, to, had skills in certain cloud technologies and just didn't want the module, wanted to go for cloud operations or architecture. Or we had people that just wanted to take the technology skills to get up to speed on some of the technologies but had no interest in the architecture or the operations course. So it's absolutely built so that you can take that individual credential if you so need it. And, and the only thing I'd add to that too, Richard, is that um, that is what's great too about the fact that there are individual exams. So that if, if someone wants to only take cloud technologies, for example, then they could take the course, take that exam, and then be able to um, show that they took that exam, passed it, and have a thorough grasp on uh, the subject matter of cloud technologies. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we have one more question, and um, I know this has been stated before, but if you could again reiterate, what is the actual name of the course to be referenced on borderless learning? So the actual courses that will be referenced on uh, the Borderless Learning website should be Cloud Technologies, Cloud Operations, and Cloud Architecture. They may, they may put NCTA or Cloud Master as a precursor to um, those terms, but um, when you're searching the Borderless Learning website, I would definitely use um, the, the yellow titles that we see here. Great, thank you. And it looks like we just had one more question come in. Um, do you receive any credentials if you only take one course? Like a certificate yes. or something like that? Yeah, you, you'll receive a credential in the name of that module. So for example, if you take the Cloud Operations course, you will receive a credential under the name Cloud Operations. All right, so it looks like that is it for our questions. Thank you so much for this great presentation. It was extremely informative. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for participating in today's Hot Topic webinar. We had a lot of really great questions. Um, as you can see, we are very excited about cloud technologies and cloud training programs. Um, you can contact Borderless Learning for the list of classes they offer and upcoming new classes and schedules. Remember that the winner of today's Amazon gift card will be notified early next week via email by a representative from Borderless Learning. And just one more, one more call out is that this um, webinar was recorded today and will be available uh, in the next few days on the Field Nation YouTube channel if you'd like to watch it again or there's somebody you would like to, to share this information with as well. 
So thank you, Tori and Richard, for our webinar today. Thank you for having us. Same here. Thanks, everybody, for attending.